How's everybody doing? You, you hungry? Getting ready for dinner? Well, we, uh, we have a problem. We do have a good dinner tonight, but uh, the reality is, is that uh, coming in the future, as our friends here from Cargill and Walmart are going to talk to us about, um, we've got a lot of people coming online who are going to be hungry, and they say by 2050, we may have to have double the amount of food. And uh, if you do the math, that's a very difficult challenge. And um, so, uh, and the guy, we were going to have a scientist with us today, John Foley, who was unable to make it, but I'm going to summarize his solution. So he says we got to do five things to actually solve this problem of feeding two billion more people. We've got to freeze the ecological footprint. We've got to grow more on the, on the lands that we're already growing food on, raise the yields. We have to use the resource inputs like water and fertilizer, et cetera, much more efficiently. We have to reduce food waste. And probably most provocatively, we have to shift the diet. Because today, 55% of, of the food that's grown goes to actually human calories. About 36% goes to feeding livestock, and then another nine to fuels. So how are we going to do this? And no matter how you slice this challenge, uh, it looks like we're going to have to change, and we're going to have to innovate significantly, and probably pretty soon. So we're going to start with that. So, so Dave, what are some of the innovations that you are actively working on or you see coming in the future that you're most excited about or you think are most necessary? Jib, I think one of the things that's most interesting is the use of technology relative to agriculture production, food production. Something that we're doing at Cargill, actually we've been, we've been involved in ag technology, precision agriculture since the 1990s, but we've got a program called Next Field. And it right now is looking at roughly two to three acre plots with farmers and helping them with the use of technology to understand w where can they get the most efficiency in their field? What are soil additions, conditions, ideal, not enough moisture, needs more moisture, needs more fertilizer or less? Mm -hmm. So it's using satellite imaging, GPS to tell them, here's where you need more seeds, more fertilizer, less fertilizer, more water or less, to, to the point that Dr. Foley made, which is, you need to be more efficient about at the, the land that you have. So I think for us, the use of technology, and we think by 2020, we will be able to have over a, close to a million acres in production using next field, mm -hmm. I think is a really interesting and exciting component of agriculture today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jack, you, uh, you often are known to say it's all about safe, affordable, sustainable, that's the future. So why don't you tell us a few sure. thoughts I on your uh, innovation? I think, you've, I think you framed. I think they framed up the question really, really clearly. The challenge for the for the world is to produce more food with less resources. The challenge for Walmart, when we sit here as one of the largest, the largest buyer of food in the world, the challenge that we have is how do we source more food so that it's safe, it's affordable, and it's sustainable. When we think the challenges, the kind of challenges that we face when we when we we currently buy a billion pounds of bananas, and by the year twenty. 18, we're going to have to buy two billion pounds of, pounds of bananas. How do we do that? What's sustainable? What amount, what amount of water are we going to need to do that? What amount of fertilizer is going to be, have to be used in that context? And what's the impact and the environmental impact of that? And that's constantly how, we how we're thinking about our challenges going forward. And um, so from an innovation point of view, we, we, we really are very much in the hands of people like Cargill and Monsanto and a lot of the people who are doing a lot of technological innovation. And we very much want to encourage and convene the people that are involved in helping us produce more, produce more food more efficiently. And when it comes to product innovation, we're always looking at how do you create innovative. I brought some props with me. Can Did I you? some props? Is that okay? Are they tasty? I can't, I can't Did go you anywhere bring without bananas? a shopping bag, to be honest with you. So, um, so, so while, while you're pulling that out, Jack, yes. how, how do you get a billion more pounds of bananas? 
Well, literally, we're looking at where we're sourcing it from in the moment. Central America is a really important part of what, what the, the sourcing of bananas at the moment. We're looking at where, do we, particularly in the Americas for the United States business that we operate in, we're looking at what, what do we need to do in Colombia, what do we need to do in Ecuador, maybe even in Peru, where there's climate conditions that are going to make this work. So a little bit to your point, how do we make sure we're sourcing product from the right places and encouraging investment so that that investment, by giving long-term contracts with suppliers and vendors and growers, how do we create ourselves an opportunity for them to invest so that they can make the right returns and there's a, and additionally we're encouraging a lot of the governments in some of these countries to create the right infrastructure to allow us to get irrigation in the right place to allow us to have roads and ports and airports and whatever's needed to enable us to get the product to the marketplace so a lot of it's about kind of real infrastructure planning yeah. and giving some longer term commitments increasingly yeah. commitment over a long period of time so that people can make the investments is important to how we're thinking about our food sourcing going forward. Okay. Well, so I'm, I'm this, sorry to interrupt on okay, your, no on your um, We've got. Are you going to make us a meal or? I'm not. Um, I would. I, I would hesitate to say that I would be the person to do that, but I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I'm sure somebody could do a nice job with it. Um, Wild oats is a product we just launched, which is organic product being sold at conventional prices. So our customers have been telling us they want to buy organic food and a lot more organic food. And we've been saying, well, how do we do that? Because the price is always at a premium. How do you create a price that, pe that everybody can afford? So this idea of affordable and sustainable, how do you put those two things together? So the challenge for, a, and that's where scale can play a role, where our scale can give us the opportunity to potentially take a lot of the cost out of the flow and the distribution and the middlemen and the, the storage and the gaps in production when, when in a production line where the smaller the volume, the less efficiency there is. So as well as encouraging the farmers to grow by giving them longer term contracts, which allows them to go through the fallow periods and build organic production that's efficient, we're working through the flow to try and use our scale to minimize the cost of organic. And that's a, a, a brand that we've just launched and we're excited about what the customer reaction has been to so that. So that's a kind of innovation at a product size as well as innovation on the demand that's, side. On that's the great. Side. So that, that, that brought up a, a question for me about big versus small. So one of the great challenges, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, still a lot of people on planet Earth, particularly in developing countries who are smallholder farmers. And what we have done in this country to lower cost and, and you know, create great abundance is really agribusiness on a grand scale where you take a lot of the, you know, the people out of the equation. What what are you doing? I know you're doing a lot of stuff in Africa. What, yeah. How are you managing the tension between the need for big and to lower cost and get more, you know, volume out of it, but still maintain these these smallholder farms? And, and am I going to have a chance to share my prop too? Absolutely. Okay. I'll, yeah. So I'll answer your question and I'll show my prop. Okay. Good. Um, Managing the, full, the supply chain from start to finish is complicated, and it's r really complicated when you start talking about issues of sustainability and productivity. Yeah. But I, I've been CEO of Cargill for about five months, and it's been very clear in a very short period of time, which isn't to say it wasn't clear before, that this is the issue for Cargill and for Walmart and for our customers. Something we've been doing in, in Africa, we're in the cocoa business, is educating smallholder farmers on sustainability similar to what I was saying, but without, without the technology, really without any technology. So how do you raise your crops using less water, less fertilizer? How do you keep your labor supply safe? So if you've ever been to where cocoa is raised, use a big old machete to cut down a cocoa pod. And what we now are doing or teaching is you can use a hard stick to cut it down and smash it open and to get the beans out, with, which is much more safe. If our cocoa farmers that we buy from, the co-ops with whom we work in Western Africa, certify and if they follow these steps, whether it's to training and sustainability, we'll pay them a premium for their cocoa. And the benefit of that is it, it improves their incomes, it increases their incomes. Our customers want it, the consumers want it, and then the farmers, our partners, have more money to put back into their infrastructure. So for example, I was in one of the villages in Ivory Coast back in September, and with the premium from being certified sustainable, the Cargill Cocoa Promise with those items that I mentioned, they've built a new doctor's office, they have built a new school, and they've built a bank. 
So it's getting just basic infrastructure into the community mm -hmm. based on certifying that they've raised sustainable cocoa. So, but what about this challenge? Wouldn't it be cheaper to apply technology to, in a sense, bringing more machines and robots to bear at the end of the day, in a sense, reduce labor costs to nothing? in an ideal sense. I think in that, in, in, in that for smallholders, it's about quality of life, it's about incomes, and it's also about attracting future generations of labor into, into the marketplace. So I think technology, machinery on large, large scale farms, particularly yeah. in North America, the US and Canada, yeah. that, that may be a better idea. But in places like Africa where it's so basic and the farming of cocoa mm -hmm. is so fundamental and so, so much part of the community, I don't think it lends itself to that as much. Yeah, okay. Well, um, Jack, this is actually a question for both of you, kind of looking from the outside in. I mean, the world you, you all live in is day after day, you're, you're, you're managing flows of, of materials and, and trying to think about where you're gonna get your bananas and how you're gonna work with your cocoa farmers. So, you know, thinking of yourselves as running some of the largest food businesses in the world, what is it, if you were, uh, let's just say, uh, a CEO outside of your business, if you were in an NGO or an academic institution, again, somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about sustainability and food and long-range long issues, what is it, and this is a question, again, for both of you, that, in a sense, if you were outside looking in at you, you would be saying, hey, Jack, yep. I wish you would do more of this, or have you thought about this? What, what is it that in a sense, maybe you wish you could work more on, but, but can't for whatever reason. Yeah, I, I think from a, from a looking at Walmart perspective, I think we're doing a lot of things in the sustainability space, which I think are right. I think I would be encouraging us to move faster, and I think I would be encouraging us to create a context and an environment that allows the right things to happen in terms of sustainability going forward. Maybe linking a little bit, Jib, to the conversation you've just been having about small and big and how it all works. I think there are real benefits in bringing scale to bear to help small scale farmers produce better. I think of some of the areas like the Mississippi River Delta, which in some ways became, its fertile agricultural land became used much less as cheap oil and cheap energy, a lot of the production went to yeah. California and certainly in the produce world. So cheap oil and, and energy allowed that product to be distributed. Increasingly with the pressures on oil, on, on energy costs and the impact that's having on the climate and the environment, more production needs to get brought closer to, to, to the point of sale. And this applies for us in China or India or Central America or, or in the United States. The, the advantage that Walmart maybe can bring to that is convening the right technology partners, the right innovation. You know, it's, it's fascinating listening to people like Monsanto, the kind of intensive precision agriculture techniques that we can help smallholder farmers with to get more productive and more yield so that we can produce more food with less resources. So I think this, how does Walmart convene and, and get together between the big and the small to create more efficient production within the fertile areas of the, of the world? You know, places like Peru, which is an amazingly interesting ecosystem in terms of what it could do to produce a lot more food for the, for, I'd be wanting Walmart to say, well, how can you encourage that? And there's parts of Africa where the same thing could apply, where there's great agricultural land that we could use more effectively and more efficiently to feed more people. Yep. Okay. I, I would and, say, and by, the, by the way, uh, please prepare your questions, because as soon as this, I'm gonna go out and, and ask your questions, so yeah. Three things, go faster. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the world's, there's so much at stake relative to climate change. Well, how, how do we go faster? You both said that. I, th I think it's conversations like this. I think it's the fact that, that Walmart's convening a session two weeks ago with, yeah. it's getting it onto the agenda of CEOs, as I said. Yeah. I didn't know, I knew it was important, but as I come to the new seat, I realized, wow, there's really a lot going on. And there's a dialogue, I think having this kind of dialogue but putting it top and center of the CEO and the, and the leadership team of any, of any food company, really any company's desk, what can we do? Yeah. There's eight, 900 million malnourished people in the world. They depend on us figuring out how to get them food and how to produce it sustainably. Number two, work, be transparent. Mm -hmm. The world wants to know where's my food coming from? How is it made? How was it grown? Mm -hmm. And I think in the absence of information, people will fill a void with negative facts or fear. Mm -hmm. And three, don't be afraid to work in partnership. And that might be working with your competitors, 
But when it comes to sustainability and when it comes to enhanced food production with NGOs, which both our companies do, with governments mm -hmm. uh, and with our competitors, you, you, we're not smart enough to know what all there is to know. We're one part of the supply chain, but you've got to work effectively and aggressively with the right partners to do it. Yep. Good. Any questions out there? Yes, right there. <coughs> Hi, a Adrian Benepe from the Trust for Public Land. Do either of your companies worked with nonprofit organizations to encourage them to provide um, deals for farmers to keep their land in farming? So maybe their farming isn't enough to keep them profitable, but if they can do some kind of a where they sell essentially the, the right to not develop the land for the future. Are either of you working that philanthropic vein? I don't know of the, so we work with World Wildlife Federation, Nature Conservancy, CARE. Um, I don't know that any of those specifically have programs relative to uh, what you just asked. I'm gonna find out, that's a good question, so I appreciate your helping me learn, but I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. So specifically, we work with the same CI and, and EDF and World Wildlife who are doing a lot of work. Again, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I will go and find out. I think part of the issue in terms of long-term profitability from agricultural land, though, is, is about having farmers that are profitable. And ultimately, and I think philanthropic <coughs> way can make some progress to that, ultimately, we think we can play a role in trying to give longer-term commitments, which it takes the vagaries of price, which tends to be the thing that makes it difficult for farmers to continue. They have a bad year and it makes it difficult for them to continue. The vagaries of price, if you can get a long-term contract with an organization like Walmart or some of our people in the middle of that, it creates an environment that allows the volatility in price to go up, not be so um, important to the short-term profitability. And that's something that we think we can play a pretty big role in. I, th I just, if I could add to that point, because I think it's a good one and an important one, and it may not be specific to your question, perhaps indirectly, but relative to developing a farming industry in Africa, the, 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 the fact is it's, a, it's, an, it's an undeveloped industry and farmers grow their crops and then everybody knows when they have to sell it. Yeah. And so if they've had a bad year, if there's weather conditions or market conditions, they may not get the ideal price. So one of the things that we can do is create storage facilities or create yeah. hedging mechanisms that can help them, give them a guaranteed floor or give them, they, they know what they're gonna get for their crops going in so that they keeps them in farming. So it might not be directly related to land use, but it's relative to your point, Jack, about price guarantee. And that, price that, floor. that volatility in price, not only does it start in, particularly in the developing world, it can take people out of farming, but it actually puts people into big uh, problems in terms of starvation and poverty. So it's a, it's a price and what scale can do to create uh, floors is a big big deal. Good. In the back. Rudy Lamprecht from Switzerland to Dave McClellan. Um, you mentioned about 30% of America's food production goes into energy. Um, how much if I'm right, if I, or if I overheard you correctly. How much um, does this the carbon, uh, reduce the carbon footprint compared to conventional fuels? Well, it's I a good chance for me to use my prop, which is an <laughs> ear of field corn. So uh, relative to the corn crop, this most recent corn crop, which was a record or close to a record, 14 billion bushels and about a third went into ethanol, and a third went into animal feed, and then you had about 15% for export, and then the rest would go into for human consumption and other uses. And so the question becomes, it, your question was about carbon footprint, and I think there's a lot of arguments on both sides of the table, which is when you're done grinding corn for ethanol, have you re net reduced the carbon footprint? I think an equally interesting question about corn and using for energy rather than food is flexibility around policy uh, that, that has flexibility in times of stress relative to either to, to energy usage and mandates. And it's currently being debated in Washington, D.C. relative to how much corn or how much ethanol must go into blending. And so the point I'm trying to make is that with corn, um, there's, there's enough to, there, there's enough that can help 
uh, fill the, the caloric deficit to, to, if you reduce the amount that must go into energy. Now that involves developing alternative energy solutions, but it also, in times of stress on the crop, means you've gotta be flexible about how much goes into energy. So two years ago, I just mentioned 15% of the crop was exported. Two years ago, the US imported corn. You can believe that. If you may remember, it was a really hot and dry summer in the American Midwest, but the fact is, because of the ability to trade, we were able to bring in the corn to fill the deficit. But I, so Rudy, I don't have a stat that says it reduces the carbon footprint, but I think it's a point of debate, which is ultimately how much are you really reducing carbon by moving corn into ethanol? And I think an equally important point is, question is, how much, what do you, how, how, what, is, what is the balance, the right balance between food versus fuel? Maybe you should do your pop quiz. Oh, quick quiz, trivia question with just a couple minutes remaining. How many ears of corn per stalk? Very Whoa. good. Oh, got it. Inside got info. It. You totally got tell, me. I was tell, like eight. Tell, yeah, Jim guessed it. <laughs> like, there must be more than ever. Right. <laughs> and when you drive by a cornfield, you think, look at all that corn. Look at all those ears. And it's one, That's sometimes nice. two. But uh, that was, I thought, a little fun fact about corn. All right. So speaking of grains, Jack. So, you know, I, I, I live here in California. And the, the big new <clears> thing is kind of these paleo diets. And the paleo diets, for those who don't know it, it's all about meat and, you know, kind of veggies, no grains. And yet, you know, if we're, if we're looking at how many people are on the earth and how many more people are kind of moving up the food chain. So, so what do you see in terms of the mix in, of calories direct from plants to, and this is for both of you, actually. Yep. Is that going to have to change in order to feed the world? I Ultimately, the consumer will decide whether that happens or not. And we, we tend to tend to follow what the consumer does in that. And if the consumer wants a load of organic product, yeah. we're going to find them organic product. If they want to buy a load of beef, we're going to have to find them beef. The challenge is it, how do you do it safely, mm -hmm. affordably, and sustainably? Yeah. And I think that then leads you to the conversation that we've just been having, which is what is the role of technology? Mm -hmm. What is the role of efficiency? What is the role of scale to try and manage that in such a way that whatever the consumer wants ultimately we'll be able to do that in, in, in such a way. And technology plays the key role in this. It seems to me that the role of technology and how food production's changed so dramatically over the course of the last, po really post-war in the United States, which has seen the most astonishing efficiency created through technology and really smart people like Norman Borlaug and some amazingly talented people that have created much more yield from the same thing. Ultimately, I think that will be the solution. What the consumer chooses to eat or not eat mm -hmm. ultimately will be decided by the consumer. And what we as, I think, retailers and manufacturers and processors and mm -hmm. sourcing have got to figure out a way of delivering them against that. Good. Dave, a couple more seconds. Anything you want to? I think it's a good point, but particularly as it relates to meat, and there's, a, there's, there's new focus on sustainable beef. In fact, I think there's a panel on it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's a potential game changer relative to sustainable, sustainable beef and the use of ag. It's, it's an important focus. And it's not inconceivable that the beef industry will find a replacement for beef that tastes like beef. Yeah. It's I, not I tried a burger the other day. So it's not inconceivable not that a, technology will change all of this going forward. Great. Well, thank you both very, very Thanks, much. Jim. Thank you all. Thanks. Enjoy your dinner tonight. All right.